Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us the author of The Expert Witness, My Life at the Top of Scientology, Jesse Prince. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Jesse, your new book cover, the look of it is so great. I mean, it's just got a great look to it. It's You have this, the Masonic eye of the pyramid on top yeah yeah <laughs> the, ex the expert witness my life at the top of scientology <clears throat> and at the bottom it says secret society blues yes it looks like the cover of a jazz album <laughs> well i wanted to kind of make it a little bit uh, uh a little bit of mystery with a little bit of flavor i guess would be the best way to say and and just make it a very relatable book. Well, it's a very handsome book cover. And uh, that picture of you on front where you're posing, uh, you're obviously seated in a witness box somewhere. What's the? Where did the picture come from on the cover? I'm so, so glad you asked that. <clears throat> I'm actually not seated at all. This is a picture of me uh, when Scientology first began doing it's international management briefing events, mm -hmm. which I guess was probably right around 1984. And <clears throat> this is when we had all of our nice uh, Beverly Hills clothes being made for us and doing our shopping and looking our best. That's a very expensive, nice suit that I have on. And I'm actually at a podium giving a briefing to Scientologists. I believe the place was at the Bonaventure right uh, in downtown Los Angeles. You'll also notice, uh, you know, on my head, I had that RTC ring. We all had that gold uh, oh, yeah. signet ring. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very handsome picture, uh, uh, professionally done. So it's a it's a great cover. And uh, I really- Well, let me, let me just finish telling you one other thing about it. The cover is by Jeff Hawkins, just let me say that. But that background, the, the picture of me, that background was added uh, to give it a courtroom appearance and to give it the appearance that I'm in the courtroom. But as I said, it's actually from an event. And that, that pyramid on top is a, a personal design that I wanted uh, for it. But Jeffrey designed it, and it really came out nice. And then I wanted to put the crosses on there on the book cover and I wanted them to be in red and I specifically wanted where the word Scientology appeared for for the cross to be upside down. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, very, very symbolic. Uh, I, yeah. I can appreciate all the uh, esoteric iconography myself being a Freemason and a Knight Templar. So it's a book someone like me would pick up and go, this guy's tuned in. It's very esoteric. But you can see Jeff Hawkins' quality coming through on the cover. Great work, uh, Mr. Hawkins. So yeah. th Now, the book has so much, but I wanted to um, zero in on one, one part of the book that's uh, of interest to me because I've researched it, as have so many others. And that's, we're going to talk about the final days of L. Ron Hubbard and the death of L. Ron Hubbard and what happened in the aftermath, because you were there. Right. So you're in the Religious Technology Center. <clears throat> you, you're reporting to Vicki Asneran. Well, Vicki, yeah, Vicki was the person, I guess the overall in charge or the commanding officer or the executive director or the other myriad addresses that Scientology had as to distinguish who the hell the boss is. Yeah, but but basically it's, it's, it's Vicki, David Miscavige, you, a handful of other people running the show while L. Ron Hubbard's in hiding. That's right, and you know, he was in hiding specifically because the Department of Justice was looking for him, as well as the IRS. There were two separate government cases, and um, the, the lawyers had pretty much lost the motions and you know uh, as mentioned before you know through through private investigators and, and police reporting to private investigators about Scientology we knew in advance 
the day the raids were supposed to happen, where the process was, as far as the warrants getting ready to come down, and blah, blah, blah. And, and we were able to be so well informed about these things, thanks to Gene Ingram and um, the money. You know, Scientology, when all of us spells, open that purse because everybody wants it. You, you would be amazed how easy it is to uh, pay a cop to a, a police officer or some law, not all of them. And I don't want to give that impression, but some of them, it's very easy to just give a little money and they will look the other way or do something that is against the law. Well, sure, there's dirty cops. And with Scientology, when flattery, and intimidation and legal threats fail. There's always money, and uh, up. you know it's just whatever it takes, right? Now, sure, Jesse, I got to ask you this question. Now, you're a true believer at this point in the technology of Scientology and Dianetics, and you're very committed to clearing the planet and everything else. Uh, however, you write in your book that that after the mission holder massacre, you realize that the top of Scientology is really different than the rank and file everyday Scientology for everybody else, correct? Well, you know, that's when it kind of started to set in. And I mentioned that as well in the books by being exposed to the actual advices that, you know, these orders, directions, they call them advices in Scientology that would come in from Elrond on, on a daily basis almost, uh, uh, I, I shouldn't say daily, every other day, two, three times a week, when he was on a roll, uh, these orders would come in and it would, it would take as long to type the messages and get them out, then the next thing you know, here, here comes more, you know, so the place was in a, a state of flux constantly when I was there, I mean, it was just, Everything about it was shocking to me. And that Mission Holders event was one of the very first things that that I was ordered to go to. And this is before I was ever an executive in RTC. I, I don't think I, I made that point clear, but I, I did on Tony's blog today. And everything that I saw and witnessed was nothing short of shocking to me. And this is not the Scientology that uh, I had been trained on and quality controlled for so long. And then, you know, to be right there at the top, it was like, are you kidding me? They don't, they don't do anything that I've learned. <laughs> I'm a fish out of water all over again. Now this, this is very intriguing because you, you go from a, a highly technical, technically trained terminal. In fact, in our previous interview, you were selected personally by L. Ron Hubbard because you were so technically trained in, in, in auditing, cramming, uh, the other aspects of, of uh, the technology. Right, and I just want to be clear, I was not uh, selected by L. Ron. I was uh, presented to him as the person that met the qualifications that he himself laid down, which is he, he pretty much wanted the best in simple everyday terms, he wanted the best teacher. He wanted the best person that he could find at teaching others what he had to say or his ideas or his ideology, as well as being able to correct those that uh, didn't understand what he was saying. And that really is the role that I that he wanted, and that's what. And, and I was the person that was scavenged, presented to him as that person fulfilling that role. Okay, I appreciate the clarification. So you were vetted and you met L. Ron Hubbard's clarifications. <clears throat> but then once you go up to the, to, the, uh, to the top echelons of Scientology, it's quite different than the, than the lower echelons. It's, it was totally different. It was like, what is the point? of me spending all of these years studying and doing this exactly perfectly only to get to the very top to find out that, you know, no one cares about that. And, uh, you, you know, at, at one point, it, it was so disconcerting to know that they didn't care about that because at the time, yes, I was a believer and, you know, I thought 
had some idea what I was doing was helping people in general. But um, no, they didn't believe it, and they didn't care. And Miscavige, you know, it was so funny is that uh, he was the least interested or qualified person to even go along with the, the, the psychology dogma at all. I mean, he was like, no, I can't do that stuff, and he never cared. So, but To that point, um, there was a recent article on Tony Ortega's blog uh -huh. in, in which somebody analyzed all of the um, David Miscavige's uh, campaign ribbons and other ribbons that he wears on his captain David Miscavige uniform. Yeah. And, and I have to laugh, just as an, an aside, during the uh, trial of Monique Rathbun versus David Miscavige and others, uh, his attorney, David Miscavige's attorney, uh, Mr. Jefferson, made a big deal about don't call my client Captain Miscavige. And uh, Ray Jeffrey would say, well, he is a captain in the Sea Org. Well, well, that's honorary. He's not really a captain. So it seems that... Uh, when it suits him, he wants to be a captain in charge of the Sea Org, but when it doesn't suit him, he, that's just an honorary title. But one of the campaign ribbons he has is a red one. It's a permanent Class 12 case supervisor. Did he have <laughs> That's funny. That's what I said, but it is. He, he actually wears the ribbon that my wife Karen earned is a permanent class 12 K supervisor. Did he wear that ribbon when you knew him? Uh, no, no, he, he wouldn't dare. But let me let me just say this uh, 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 directly about the subject that you're bringing up. You're talking about him uh, avoiding the title of captain, uh, you know, by attorneys. I, I, I want to let you know there's an exact reason for that. Um, in 1982, when Alpha Services was being formed and Miscavige uh, was on the board of directors of that corporation, him, Norman Starkey, Lyman Spurlock, Pat Bryce, and maybe a few others actually terminated their CR contracts because they could not work, be, a, be in the CR and work for this uh, other company that was a for-profit company uh, because of the conflict of interest. So when Miscavige is, is like telling you no, no, his lawyers are saying no, that's honorary, blah, blah, blah. What they're trying to actually cover up is the fact, the same uh, issue that Elrod had, which is that is he's the managing agent of all the corporations, whether it's ASI, uh, RTC, Church of Scientology, blah, 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 blah. And money is inuring to him. In other words, he starts to incur the same problems that Elron had with the IRS, you know, with, with taxes and blah, blah, blah. So legally, he must separate those things because he's really not even in New York, period. Which means he should not have any authority or, or anything to do with it otherwise corporately for corporate integrity purposes. Yeah, because if... if when David Miscavige would, was at Author Services, had he been shown to be working in the Church of Scientology, which is a different corporation, he would have pierced the corporate veil and been seen as the managing agent. Which happened anyway, because they were coming after him anyway. Just like when they came after Earl Ryan, his name was on the list. But Pat and Annie's name weren't on the list. They were on the list at a point in time, but they carefully, they, they were taken off of any kind of board of directors or corporate responsibility for any of those entities. In other words, they weren't connected with it legally at all. Fiduciary-wise, you know, in the sure that, okay, separate thing, but they had no legal standing in the corporation, which ended up being their undoing. But, you know... <laughs> Yeah, that, that's interesting. And so that, this leads us into the topic. As a result of Leah Remini's show, Scientology in the Aftermath, where she appears with Mike Rinder, her Emmy-winning show, I would add, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, Scientology TV has no awards, and I think it's a $100 million paperweight, but I digress. Um, one thing Leah, Leah's show has drawn attention to is the deceptive nature 
of how Scientology operates, particularly at the top. What we're talking about is concealed, very concealed operations. You were involved in very secret operations. And for a lot of new Scientology listeners, you use the term L. Ron Hubbard advices. They may not know what that is. Could you explain why L. Ron Hubbard issued what he called advices? I certainly can. Uh, L. Ron is the founder of Scientology. He's the originator of it. Uh, at least he filed all of the paperwork stating his ideology. So he, he is the undisputed founder in, of Scientology and Dianetics. As the founder of Dianetics and Scientology, he had certain policies and issues that he created. And while he was the executive director, there was a point in time when Elrond assumed the responsibility of managing all of the Scientology corporations. They were called organizations back then, and then before it became convenient to be a church. But he was the undisputed leader of all of that. and, and for that reason, the IRS started looking at him for tax-wise because he wasn't paying his share of taxes. He was reaping all of this benefit from these corporations, but you know he wasn't paying taxes. So, in order to to solve that issue, all of the different Scientology entities like um, uh, the uh, the AOLA, the Celebrity Center. Uh, the different local organizations had to incorporate separately as nonprofit organizations with uh, their own board of, boards of directors and um, trustees and managers and blah, 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 separate from Scientology International, separate from the Sea Org. In other words, each organization by law to, to have its tax exempt status has to be able to prove that it is a separate in, uh, entity run by the people that are listed on all of its corporate papers. And those of us know anything about Scientology, that concept could be nothing further from the truth because, you know, Scientology contradicts itself in that it can send a group of people that they call missionaries in there to get rid of all of the corporate people, assign new corporate people. As a matter of fact, anyone holding a corporate title in Scientology has already signed um, a, 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 a notice or already tended their resignation, undated resignation letter, which is a requirement to even be in it. So it's like the day that you're honored with the position on Scientology's corporate board, you also resign. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the way that Disneyland works. And, uh, yeah, the undated resignation. But mm -hmm. so, so basically, as I understand it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, when L. Ron Hubbard resigned as executive director in 1967, he was claiming that he had nothing to do with running the day-to-day -day affairs of the church. And because just for tax reasons, and that's all. Yeah, it had nothing to do with anything. But the IRS said, "Hey, buddy, you're a nerd, you know, a nerd. It had to do with the money." from everywhere and nor to him and he and he him getting it and you know and yeah anyway yeah, yeah Scientology lost its tax exemption in 1967 that was the the Church of Scientology of California but they basically told the IRS to go to hell and kept acting like they were a tax exempt church there were lawsuits at some point L. Ron Harvard has to go into hiding but also, you need to know this as well, because I just want to correct the record. Sure. It, of course, Scientology was recalcitrant, and the yes, they told the IRS to go to hell. But along the way, they had to put up a certain amount of money to appeal. You know, there's the appeal process. And if, had they not appealed, they wouldn't exist, okay? But they had to show X amount of dollars for or show assets in order not to just for the IRS and the Justice Department not just not to walk in and start trampling the place <clears throat> while they appeal, you know, because they had the appeal process. So while they while they appealed, they had to put up a bunch of money. They did 
appeal yeah. the revocation of their 67 tax exemption and so they had to put up money because you do it in an appeal exactly but, but what uh, I, I guess what what I wanted to get to to kind of set it up is at, at some point L. Ron Hubbard has to go into hiding to avoid the service of subpoena or being arrested or anything else and this is kind of the end game we're heading to in, in his last days because he goes up to the Creston Ranch with Pat Nanny Broker, uh, Stephen Falf, correct? Uh, well, you know, they purchased that ranch during, at some point during the time period that I write about in, in my book, at some point between 1982 and sometime after 1982 or maybe before. But specifically about that ranch, I remember um, suitcases, like millions of dollars in cash being prepared to be given to Pat Broker because they were negotiating or doing something buying properties up there in Creston. This is like before they had the ranch. So <clears throat> what they were doing before that, they actually had another property which to this day, I don't know where the hell it is, but it was another place uh, somewhere probably closer to Nevada where I am right now before they had that Creston Ranch and where they ended up one this day. Yeah, as I understand it, L. Ron Hubbard had several backup ranches, you know, several bolt holes, if you will. But, but um, L. Ron Hubbard was running the Church of Scientology by, by issuing what he called advices Right, and these, so after he decided to clean up his act, because the IRS basically informed Scientology lawyers, you're never going to achieve tax-exempt status unless you can prove L. Ron is not the managing agent of all of these corporations. So in order to solve that, instead of uh, saying, you know, L. Ron is writing policy, he stopped writing policy, you know, disassociated himself from quote unquote management. <clears throat> but now all reports from organizations still go to him. The statistics, specifically how much money each uh, region, continent, country is making internationally for Scientology, and that means him. And so in order to skip over that little part of, of uh, being the managing agent, now he just issued advices. Like, I heard about this, and, and it's an advice. And on these advices, it never stated who the information was coming from. It never stated from L. Ron to blah, 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 or any of that. It was just words with orders or an opinion, and uh, they would be given to who it was. So, you know, it's, it's a child's game because it was so obvious that he, instead of uh, uh, directing new policy, new bulletins, now he's just calling in advices. It, it's silly. You know, Scientologists are so blind to their own naivete that they do silly things like this. Sure. Yeah, but so Ron's, <clears throat> Ron's actually running the church, and, but instead of writing formal policy he's just calling it advices as a workaround mm -hmm. the irs has a criminal invest a irs criminal investigation division is investigating hubbard and miscavige ron's in hiding you're you're in the mix in this thing now and we're busy shredding these advices as fast as he gives them to us as we're in court saying that they're nothing but we, 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 well, can we see these things? Oh, hell no. You know, we're shredding and popping as fast as we can. <laughs> you know, Jesse, this is so, this is what is so funny about Scientology. You, you mentioned earlier that they would bribe dirty cops. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on top of that, they have to shred everything that's inconvenient. And so you have this basically criminal organization wanting to be a church and if I'm laughing it, it, it's sort of like this is why the IRS needs to revoke their tax exemption but I'm not going to go there now but it's just like 
it's mind boggling when, when you get into their actual behavior. Now, what yeah. I want, want to, I wanted to ask you, when did you first get wind of the fact that L. Ron Hubbard was dying? What went on when that was first mentioned that, oh my God, Ron's dying? Well, interesting question. Um, this, when I started to worry about L. Ron dying, uh, that was right when, believe it or not, when Robin Scott got arrested. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he, he, Aaron wanted somebody in jail, wanted somebody in jail, you know, and so that person ended up being Robin Scott, and it was his birthday. It was Aaron's birthday, you know, it was all perfectly choreographed for that. But, but, and, uh, but uh, Jesse, Jesse, let me jump in here for, because we have a lot of new Scientology listeners Robin Scott was one of the fellows who stole the OT materials from uh, Denmark. Yes, they're proprietary uh, secret materials that turn people into superhumans. As, so, at least that's what their propaganda says. Yeah, and just for, for new Scientology listeners, a bit of Scientology history you'll find interesting, and you can find it on Google. Um, three former Sea Org members who left the church and one of the OT materials dressed up as Sea Org members. They barged into the um, organization in, in, in uh, Copenhagen and acted like they were, what, an, uh, an RTC mission? Right. They demanded to do an inspection and they demanded to examine the OT documents and they fled out of the building with them. Of course, uh, Jesse, a little, little bit of trivia you'll be interested in. My wife, Karen, was on a mission at St. Hill investigating three strange, mysterious suicides that had happened there of Scientologists. Mm -hmm. And when this uh, theft of OT materials occurred, she was sent up to Copenhagen to find out what the hell was going on. Mm -hmm. So L. Ron Hubbard's policy is that he wanted a head on a pike. So you're saying that you were able to get Robin Scott arrested, you meaning the Church of Scientology, and that's when you first got wind that, that uh, the old man was dying? Well, after after we reported to him that um, we got Robin Scott arrested, and, you know, he had been beating us mercilessly, you know, with orders and, and stuff, and a lot of sleepless nights and things, and then when we told him that we had accomplished this. It was kind of like a, man, you know, and, and we were like, well, that's not what he did when we got those mission holders, you know, or, or any of the other wicked things <laughs> we had been involved in. But uh, it was like, man, you know, so we suspect something is wrong, was wrong, and it was maybe just a matter of days that we found out that he had had a stroke. He had had his first stroke. Hmm. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Pancreatitis. Oh, pancreatitis. We found out that his pancreatitis was acting up. And, um, you know, all of them, any of the messengers that had been around for a while knew that uh, when Elron's pancreatitis started acting up, you might as well be in hell. Because when he was miserable, everyone was miserable. And he was miserable. Pancreatitis is very painful. And he was not one to, uh, <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't have a high tolerance for pain. So, yeah, that's when we, we figured out. And then, then it was like, oh, you know, well, it's just, uh, it's just that. And he actually went to the doctor for it, you know, so we were pretty clear. Yeah, that was serious. Yeah, it was serious, but it was treatable, and he was going to the doctor. It was wasn't like touch assist, auditing, n none of that crazy insanity. He was he was doing uh, oh, what you're supposed to do when you're seriously ill. He was seeking proper medical treatment. Yeah, as he had had for uh, problems over the years. Um, so what happens? I mean, when does it start becoming evident that it's he, he doesn't have a long time to live 
Well, that wasn't. It, well, that came in. I guess uh, '76. You know, right after, right after Christmas, really. Seventy, eighty-six. What I'm saying. 86. Yes. Eighty-six. You know, he had had a stroke, and uh, after the pancreatitis, and um, you know, certain things started happening, and then he had a second stroke. He never went to the hospital for either of those times. <clears throat> and um, in the book, you know, I, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, being informed hourly on certain days and times whether or not he had died or whether he was dead. Yeah, you do, and, you, you do mention that. It, Jesse, um, one question that's always bothered me that maybe you could answer. L. Ron Hubbard is dying. Now, he has a personal physician who's a Scientologist named Dr. Gene Denk. And in the middle of this thing where Ron's dying, Dr. Denk, David Miscavige, and others go off to Reno to go gambling. No, no, no. No, no. no. Was that before or after? How, how, that, that was before. That was before. That was after he had the first stroke and before he had the second stroke. Well, it's, so help me out here. The, the founder of, of Scientology has a stroke. Instead of making sure he's hospitalized for a stroke, which is what you do with an elderly person, they leave him at the ranch and they go off on a gambling trip to Reno. I, I just, I've never been able to figure out the what they were doing or why they went to Reno. Was it the trip already planned or, or did they just... Well, why, you, why, why would they do that? Well, you know, the, the, my memoir, when, I, when I'm when i writing and I'm speaking about these things, I, I, I've been very careful not to get into any type of conjecture or, or opining about things that I did not personally experience or was given personal knowledge of. And and so what I write, around, I write about in the book, and I do cover these things, and I speak about what I know specifically, but why people kind of did what they did, I, to this day I don't have an answer for those types of questions. But what I what I uh, can say is what did happen. Now, why they did it that way, I don't know. But what did happen, and what I witnessed and was privy to, that's what I'm able to speak on. And I speak on it quite a bit. There's a chapter after the death where I kind of opine and start putting the puzzle together mm. uh, and, um, and and come to a conclusion. But I clearly label it for what it is, you know. But the great majority of my book is just a narrative of what happened, who was involved. You know, I give the time place for me, Vic. It's like a lifetime sex check. <laughs> you know, I sure. try to sure. I and try to give as much information, including what you can't see, which is emotions, feelings, and things like that, to the story to make it uh, to bring it to life. Well, I appreciate the distinction that you, since you don't know, you can't make an, an opinion on it. It just it's always struck me as odd that uh, the the founder is dying, so let's go drink and gamble in Reno. It seems incredibly irresponsible. Well, that's something for the police to investigate, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And you know, and that's what I talk about in my book, because I was just—I mean, at, you know—I didn't know that that was happening at the time. But you know, because in Scientology, even though Miscavige disclosed to me, and you know, that this is what they were doing at the time, it, that didn't really mean much to me. Because the right hand really never knows what the left hand is doing. At that time, I did not know that LRH had not been to the hospital after having the first stroke. I knew Dink was there. I knew Miloff went there. I, I assumed he was taken to the hospital because when he complained about the pancreatitis, he went to the hospital and Dink went to the hospital with him. 
So that he had a stroke and didn't go to the hospital I, is not anything I knew about at the time. Yeah, that's another out, out point to me. You have a, an elderly man who's not in good health and you you keep him at the ranch. Now, when do you hear that he, he has died? What's the feeling? You, you write about it in your book, but tell our listeners, what's the mood and feel? Who, who tells you L. Ron Hubbard is dead, Jesse? Well, me and Vicky knew he was dead because um, we were getting hourly, minute by almost minute by minute reports. That, you know, it's like is he, it's like kids in the back seat of the car and the parents are driving. You know, it's yeah. like is he dead yet? Is he dead yet? Is he dead yet? You know, yeah. was was kind of the thing. And then people stopped talking. Hmm. So you know, Pat and I wouldn't talk no more. They wouldn't answer the calls. Nothing. So we assumed. He was dead, but we weren't officially told he was dead until we went to office services and David, you know, Miscavige did the thing with dimming the lights and, you know, telling us, you know, the short story that, you know, he ended up telling the rest of the world, which is, you know, he dropped his body, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's interesting. L. Ron Hubbard died uh, January 24, 1986. He was in a Bluebird motorhome. He was living in the motorhome when he died. And mm -hmm. now, now, right after the death, right after there's news that he dies, <clears throat> they immediately, as you relate in your book, try to get L. Ron Hubbard uh, cremated. Right. And however, the, the, the mortuary calls the sheriff coroner up there in uh, San Luis Obispo who says, no, this, he recognizes he's L. Ron Hubbard. He says, no, we're not releasing the body without some fingerprints, blood samples, photographs. And only then would they release, would they release it. In the aftermath of Ron dying, uh, your, your late colleague, the dear Robert Von Young, mm -hmm. did a video on, on YouTube, which I have on the Scientology Money Project, where he set up a, a a lot of you senior executives went up to the ranch. You were one of the people who went up to the ranch. Sure. So when you get up to the ranch, Ron's dead. What do you do up at the ranch? Well, I, w I went there. Vicky and I went there, you know, because that was the last place he was. Pat and Nanny were there. You know, and uh, Annie was a wreck. You know, she had a lot of grief going on, and and you know, Sarge and everybody. I mean, they were drinking themselves silly. And uh, we went up there, you know, just to try to console. And actually, went up there because we knew we would have to decide what to do with all of this now. You know, it, 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 at that time, and in the position that I was in, I viewed things as an owner, you know, mm -hmm. not so much as a participant or a, a viewer, but it's suddenly like, what the hell are we going to do with this place? What do we call it? Do we turn it into a museum? Do we open it to the public? You know, it's like figuring out what to do. Well, sure. As an as an executive of an organization, you do view it as an owner. I understand that. Right. Now, did you go into the blue the, the uh, Bluebird motorhome in which Mr. Hubbard had passed away? Yes, and it was perfectly clean. You know, nothing, no, no sign of trauma. <laughs> but but what what was it like for you at the time? I mean, just spiritually, emotionally, to actually be in in the Bluebird motorhome where Hubbard had died? Was it did you feel anything? Yeah, relief. First off, when we heard that he would he had passed, it was relief because. And and I'll I'll just quickly state why it wasn't out of disrespect or for hating him or anything, but it was kind of obvious that he had been suffering mm. for for some time and uh, of suffering with his health. It, it was obvious to me that he was a sad person. He he wasn't. You know, I had a completely different concept of Elron before ever going to that end place. I, I thought this was like a really nice person, 
that figured some things out and had a true desire to help people. And he was interested in teaching other people how to help others to help people. And um, to just see him, you know, and be around him in such a mess. And then, you know, I want to add a human face to these these crazy people that are running Scientology now as well with Miscavige because you can see from those earlier pictures he was just a damn kid too you know he, he was kind of learning and, and we were having to learn from attorneys it was a high pressure world and and um, you know we, we, we kind of went through what we went through and kind of learned as we went along of uh, any Scientologist senior executive or other, otherwise can attest to the fact that Scientologists will do things wrong so many times until they finally will do it right and they spare no expense on their learning curve. I'll just mm. say that. <laughs> they wow. spare no expense on their learning curve. And it, it's, it's a, it takes them a long time to change. That's a tremendous insight. And, and I can understand that the, the, just the human feeling of you know, when someone has been suffering physically, the, the, the relief you feel that they, they're, they're dead and they're no longer yeah, suffering. And, and it was done, you know, and he had been suffering, you know, and I did feel a little sad, you know, because, you know, shit, it's, it's, it's another human. It's, you know, as humans, we, the, the emotion that we express when people are no longer with us is normally sadness. <laughs> so... Yeah. You know, I felt a little, little sad. You know, he went around, but the real, my re actual emotion was, yeah, now this is mine. You know, mm. now this is, now I have all, I had already considered it mine. I had already considered everything, you know, that was going on. I was such an integral part of it that I, you know, I didn't personally, but I mean, my group, my people. We've worked for years to make this happen, and, you know, we have had little successes along the way. Even while spending a fortune on our learning curve, we were still besting people and situations that were opposing us. Uh, and so it was like, okay, now this is ours. Now he's out of the way because we needed him out of the way, and now we can logically and peacefully proceed with Scientology because he truly was the one that created a lot of the angst and uh, craziness uh, that was going on there. So the torch had been passed to, to you know, to the what, what has often been called the Young Turks, right? Right. <clears throat> and, that, and that includes the men and women who were at the top. Now, one question I had Vicki Asneran made the statement that David Miscavige said, and so this makes it hearsay, but it's been reported that David Miscavige said concerning the criminal investigations of Hubbard and, and Miscavige, the only way to stop it now is if the old man dies. Is that what? actually came from a, de a declaration or affidavit she wrote? Oh, so it did come from a, a declaration. Yeah. So was there a feeling with with Ron dead that maybe the uh, federal taxing authorities, the criminal authority, uh, investigation authorities would lay off Scientology? Or was it just one problem out of the way? It, it was bittersweet, really, you know, because he had to die for Scientology to live. Mm. So in that regard, it was kind of bittersweet because, you know, it was his. Yeah, and that and that leads me to another question, Jesse. I just wanted to get your opinion on L. Ron Hubbard created Scientology to be about freedom. And yet he himself at the end of his life in his final years winds up in hiding from the law. He can't show his face anywhere or he could be arrested. He's sick. He's trapped on a ranch where where maybe Pat Broker and David Miscavige are controlling all communications going to him so they can lie to him. And he's drinking himself to death and everyone around him is doing it too. Well, pancreatitis, one symptom certainly is... Uh, alcoholism. Yeah, alcoholism. Long-term alcoholism. Yeah. Do you 
In your opinion, did L. Ron Hubbard become trapped by his own creation of Scientology? L. Ron Hubbard, no doubt, L. Ron Hubbard was a victim of his own machinations. He, he struggled himself by his own petards in that, and, and what the, the really poignant thing that happened to him to me that was uh, it, it just tragic is that he had that condition known as aphasia where he, he was unable to say what he was thinking. You know, I know it's almost unimaginable for people, at least it was for me until I studied it, to realize that you could suffer from a, a condition where your mind thinks one thing, but your mouth says another. Sure, and, and you, you discuss that in your book. If someone says, I want a drink of water, it comes out as, bring me a pencil. Right. So, you know, and, and, and also what I talk about is his caretakers no longer wanted to be around him because they couldn't no longer understand him because of the fucking stroke. Now, I didn't mean to say that, but if you can only imagine this old, failing health, evil person that never, that, that didn't really care about anyone now suffering inside of his own self. It's like he was in his own mind suffering. He couldn't even suffer in the world anymore because he was unable to communicate. So his, his trauma was with himself. Yeah, it's sort of a, a very karmic. There's an old Russian proverb which states, when God wants to punish a person, he takes away their mind. Yeah. And if you think about L. Ron Hubbard losing his mind, being incapacitated, and yet even the very few people who, who were around him didn't care to be care to be around him. He was difficult to deal with. So he does become a victim of his own his own creation, if yeah. you will. And, and and the reason I say that L. Ron Hubbard had once wrote about uh, uh, suppressive persons that they should be disposed of quietly and without sorrow. Well, that's what happened to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, within 24 hours of his death, he had been cremated and, th and his ashes scattered into the ocean. Without sorrow. Quietly we, and without sorrow. We were happy, happy he was gone because he was a, a merchant of chaos. All he did is spread confusion wherever he was. Well, it, it's certainly disturbing to consider this, that his attorney, Earl Cooley, uh, really showed up at the ranch with the will and uh, there a new law had been enacted in California where if you had stated that you your religion your religious beliefs forbid uh, an autopsy one could not be performed mm -hmm. Cooley showed up showed up there and showed that to the sheriff coroner right and he Cooley actually stayed with the body while it was being cremated yeah I mean it's almost like they were not going to and he didn't live long after that either. Just want to make that point too. No, you not know, at all. Not psychology at all. takes his pound of flesh. I don't care who you are. Yeah, but just the. I guess what I'm emphasizing is they, meaning Miscavige, Earl Cooley, they wanted to make sure Ron was dead and scattered in the ocean, and and he was gone. And then that goes into another phase of Scientology I'd like to cover in our next interview, but w one question. Were you in the church when you got the autopsy results and learned that Ron had been inject injected oh, with no. Mistral? No? No way. Hmm. We, th that was off limits. You know, just like learning that a basic uh, auditing, uh, that auditing comes from simple uh, uh, psychological psychiatric processes from the 50s and 60s that is hidden so of course not I never knew that I, I I only and that's why I say in the book and I make the point it is impossible to understand truly understand what Scientology is while being a part of it or being a member because they hide so much information from you that you cannot make an informed decision about it well, now, did you accept the uh, the version put forth by David Miscavige at the Palladium that L. Ron Hubbard was in a healthy body and he laid down and causally dropped the body? Of course not. We all knew that was ridiculous because 
you know, Miscavige was one of the persons asking, is he dead yet? Is he dead yet? Is he dead yet? I mean, uh, uh, Miscavige was not privileged to be anywhere near L. Ron while, while all this was going on, uh, contrary to what, what he's telling the new people now. But, um, no. And, and, and I don't want anyone to think that, you know, this was all carefully planned and choreographed, because it wasn't. This was a dumpster fire train wreck from the beginning to the end, and everybody was just trying to figure out what to do best as they went along. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, that's the way it is. Look, Jesse, that's a very important point. Because L. Ron Hubbard had laid out no succession plan for, for an orderly succession after his death, right. it, like you say, it is a dumpster fire train wreck because... Well, they have to get up to the ranch. One of the things, if you if you read, I have a post on the Scientology Money Project. It's called The Church of Scientology's Great Big Lie About the Death of Founder L. Ron Hubbard. Mm -hmm. One thing the, the sheriff coroner uh, was curious about was the long delay between the actual death and the time they notified uh, the sheriff coroner. Like, why the delay? They actually sent uh, uh, two deputies out to the scene and you know to sort of see what's going on uh, one of them was a uh, deputy uh gasset and the, the other was deputy hugh and they noted that the the bluebird trailer was immaculate because they now, cleaned it up yeah th so they there was a period of time in which ron is dead let's sanitize the scene and if it if it, if it, if it as it's been reported, there were large sums of cash up there. You know, let's let's clean up the scene so it looks neat, like an old man died in a mobile home, right, or a, a bluebird motor home. So it, it is very strange. So you obviously know the story that's given at the Palladium, where Earl Cooley and David Miscavige are stating this is not true. Well, you know, I was not there for one thing. Oh, you weren't at the Palladium? No. I didn't know that. I was in Italy with Mark Yeager giving a similar speech. Oh, I'm sorry. When he died, you know, all of the quote unquote young Turks came together and we all had decided to synchronize the announcement so that the Scientologists kind of found out all at the same time. So all of us went, some went to Australia, some went to France, me and Mark went to Italy. Get the United States thing, wherever our major, some of the United Kingdom, where our major bases were, there were representatives there announcing so that the Scientologists found out at the same time what happened. Oh, I'm glad you said that because in the book you do say you went to Italy, but I didn't realize that, I didn't realize you literally got orders, L. Ron Hubbard's died, Jesse, you and Mark get on a plane to Italy now. And this is what we did together. I just want to make that clear. It's yeah. like we we have to announce that Elrond has passed. So you know we need people in these this country, this country, this country, and we got to do it now. You got to leave tonight because you know we got we got to announce this all at the same time. So we literally ran the hell out the door with what we had. You know all of the principles. And we choreographed it so that it happened at the same time, so that, you know, Scientologists in one country weren't telling Scientologists in another country about everyone being dead before we had a chance to do it ourselves. My gosh, so you were, you, you were on a, they just bought you tickets to Italy, I assume you probably flew out of LAX? Immediately, yes. And then I was back, and then we all came back in time for the party after the a Palladium death announcement. At um, the guy's house, uh, uh, Liberace, Liberace's house. Yeah. yeah that home he had, he, he, he had owned. Yeah, well, now that, that, huge party. We had a big, huge party there. And it, that was like, I, the only thing missing at that party was the cocaine. I can tell you that right now. It was <laughs> really extravagant. Coke, uh, fountain champagne. I mean, you know, it, it, it was great. Well, no, that's so. That is so weird that, because if you look at the video of the L. Ron Hubbard death briefing, mm -hmm. it's all it's very somber, mm -hmm. very somber. But then afterwards, you guys are you guys have a big old party. 
huge, drunk, tore up, partying hard, laughing. <laughs> Is it well? Well, that's sort of evocative, uh, you know, of, of like a certain amount of of uh, celebration that you don't have to deal with Elron Hubbard anymore. Absolutely. I mean, you know, thanks for everything, but glad you're gone. You know. <laughs> you know that is brutal but that's the reality it's like this guy had been a cruel dictator and, and we so, and we, and we really start to think think about how easy our lives are going to be by just peacefully administrating Scientology we don't have to do this evil mean meanness anymore I mean at least that's what was in my mind I mean with him sure. out the if we just administered this According to these policies, and I just quickly want to make, want to make a really fast point about that. When, when, when Scientology was at the lowest of the low as far as public relations are concerned, we hired a very expensive a public relations firm, Helen Knowlton, to help us improve our public relations image. And so in order for them to understand who and what we were, we gave them a copy of Scientology's um, Green Volume Zero, which is called the Basic Staff Hack. And that that has all of the basic policies for people working in all the different divisions in Scientology, blah, blah, blah. So we said, if you want to know really what we are, just read this book. And um, after a, a couple of weeks or so, they said, okay, we got it. And then we came and we get, were summoned to the office, to Helen Nolton's office. Uh, me, Miscavige, Jigger, you know, we all, the young Turks who were dressed in our fancy uh, uh, Rodale drive suits and all of this, and we show up. And, and uh, David, so David asked him, he introduced all of us as the new people that were responsible for Scientology. And he asked him, he said, so, um, so what do you think after reading this? What do you got to do? And the guy literally took that book that we gave him and he, he held it up and he said, you see this book? If you guys just did this, you would be fine. If you just followed this policies in here, you would be fine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he said, I don't, he said, I'm really wondering why you're here. Because if this is your policy, why are you here? <laughs> that is interesting. I, yeah. I have. I have Mike, covered. Mike Rinder may even remember this because I, I think he may have been there. Well, I, I covered the story. There was an article on the um, on the blow up between uh, Hill and Knowlton, Church of Scientology, and Eli Lilly, which came later. Yeah, much later. Yeah. But I'm looking at the actual article uh, from the 1990s, and the Church of Scientology International hired Hill and Knowlton to perform the following duties: quote neutralize negative media coverage, seek a change in the direction of media coverage by building a new and positive public platform for the church and promote the many positive uh, aspects of Scientology, uh, expand new membership and increase solidarity among existing membership, unquote. So, Hillary- Volume and zero, that came directly, I'm telling you, if, they, if that's what they wrote, they get that directly from L. Ryan himself out of that green damn volume because th that's what they did. They literally said, okay, we're going to show you how to do what you say you're supposed to do. And so when Ron died, you thought if we just follow through with these policies and everything will settle down, our lives will de-stress. We don't have this insane dictator you know, ordering us to do all kinds of things, right? And we have enough money to afford our learning curve, you know, as long as we're not being destructive or unreasonable, you know, we'll make it because we had tons of fucking money. So, you know, there is, there's no problem with, you know, hiring professional help because none of us had education either. And I just want to make this point. None of us had college education, Yale education, but our lawyers did. And sure. So that's how we learned. So, so you we, could afford, could, we, yeah. we could afford the best of the best, and that's why the best of the best was always hired, to learn from that person. And Earl Cooley was stellar in that regard. Well, tell you what, Jesse, can we do a part two where we talk about the parties over up at Liberace's old house? 
and then what really begins to happen? Well, you know, that's certain, we certainly can. And, you know, that's that's pretty much covered in the book, too. And I, I really want people to, to, to read that. And I, I'll tell you something. Someone said to me that I think really made me appreciate the fact that I wrote the book. <clears throat> Someone wrote to me that I had talked to them, and this is a friend. I had spoken to them, uh, like, you know, and talked to them about events that happened at Gold with Elron dying and blah, 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 you know, and I related certain stories. But the person told me it wasn't until they read it in the book that they could, that the dots connected for them. I guess it was just more cogent. It, it's, it, you have to be more cogent when you're, when you're writing than speaking, you know what I mean? And Certainly. it made a lot more sense and, and the people were so much more appreciative. So. I really want people to also get the book so that they get get the uh, the concept, get you know the whole train of thought. Sure, and it's it, it's well worth reading. It connected dots for me. Uh, the name of the book is "The Expert Witness: My Life at the Top of Scientology" by Jesse Prince. Jesse, thank you so much for this part one. Let's cover the party forward in part two. Yes, yes, Jeffrey, and that. I thank you so much for the interview. I'm certainly most comfortable being interviewed by you. I think you do a great job. I really appreciate the effort you and Karen put forth exposing this uh, wicked group. And, um, you know, we're all on the same team. So, you know, now I have a platform, which I always needed. I, I needed my own platform. Now I have that. Move forward. Well, thank you, Jesse. Yes, you do. And I, and I, highly recommend people buy the book and I'm looking forward to part two because I feel like we just scratched the surface. So for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.